Hi, Colin. Hi. How are you? I'm good. We're both in nice warm climates. Yes, that's right. It's hot and humid here. You're very clear in the image. I hope I'm clear too. Yep, you're perfectly clear. I can see you quite well. The backdrop looks good. The lighting's warm on your face. Looks like we're recording okay, so let's just get started. I, um, I was going to ask you if you're okay with me wearing a t-shirt, but you're wearing one too. So I, I It's summer, man. <laughs> I know. I'm That's actually kind I, of a t-shirt guy anyway. I don't wear, I don't, I ever wear regular shirts anymore. No, it's you got to be comfortable, when, uh, uh, particularly when you're in, in our business. Uh, so thanks for coming on the show. Let me give you a proper introduction for those who are listening uh, that don't know much about uh, the topic, or you or me. Uh, you are a British philosopher. You've held posts and professorships at University College London, the University of Oxford, Rutgers University, and the University of Miami. And if you go to Amazon, there's a long list of uh, important books, Philosophy of Language, Philosophical Provocations, Inborn Knowledge. My favorite, The Mysterious Flame, Conscious Minds in a Material World. That's a great title, and uh, that's the subject we'll be talking about today. Your latest book is Prehension, The Hand in the Emergence of Humanity, uh, just out from uh, MIT Press last year. I should also note, parenthetically, you've written books on movies, The Power of Movies, How Screen and Mind Interact, and Shakespeare's Philosophy, Discovering the Meaning Behind the Plays. And you wrote a memoir in 20, uh, 2003, The Making of a Philosopher. So, um, and I've, I, I kind of scanned through that. It was amusing to see some of your background and your interesting uh, 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 battles with people like Dan Dennett. Uh, and it's, al- it's always fun to know that other people disagree with, uh, w- w- with each other in other fields as well. So, um, uh, but before we get into the, the topic of today, which is triggered by my Scientific American column, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, since you were kind of on the front lines of atheism activism before it became chic to be so, uh, mm-hmm. You know, after the new atheism, it became kind of cool to say I'm an atheist, but you were doing this long before it was cool. In fact, it wasn't cool at all. Uh, so do you feel somewhat vindicated to a certain extent? Like, yeah, this has turned out well. <laughs> yeah, sort of vindicated. But I, as I always say, I'm kind of a post-atheist atheist because for me, it's been such a dead issue for so long that to come out and say you're an atheist is like saying I'm a human being or I live in America. It's so <laughs> right. uninteresting. Right. That's a fact about me. I think it's very un- uninteresting, too. I think you learn almost nothing about me from finding out that I'm an atheist. I mean, almost all my friends are atheists. And I come from England, and particularly in England, it's just not. Right. 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 It's not doesn't make you stand out or make you especially brave or cool or anything like that. It's just banal, you know. Right. Well, that's right. In a, in a way, to say I'm uh, I'm an atheist doesn't tell it isn't anything to be. There's no set of doctrines that we believe. It just is lack of belief in God. Full stop. Yeah, that's it. If you wanted to find out about a person, you should ask them what their positive beliefs are. Right. On ethical issues or political issues or whatever it may be, but merely to find out you're an atheist tells you very little about a person. Of course, many people, particularly in America, think it, it tells you a lot to find out somebody is an atheist because now you know that they are immoral. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, yes, yes, and a communist or a socialist or something com- bad. Some, some undesirable or other. Right. So, so what do you call yourself on the positive side, like a secular humanist or humanist or enlightenment humanist or something along those lines? I used to have a, politi- a, poli- a long political description of myself, a progressive libertarian, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> what else, um, skeptical, secular, humanistic, soft-hearted, hard-headed, cosmopolitan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> L- living in Florida, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, the problem with 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 um, labels like this is they're full of baggage in people's minds that you just don't know. Uh, I I don't like to use the word libertarian anymore because now this is kind of associated with some pretty far uh, extreme nutters like Alex Jones or conspiracy I agree that nuts. It's been devalued. When I say libertarian, I mean a follower of J- of John Stuart Mill in his book on liberty. Yes, yes, which is a classic text, very important text, which people really should should be taught in high schools you know everybody should understand that absolutely the um i don't know if you know the heterodox academy this is uh, you know jonathan heights group um that is promoting john john stuart mill in fact they have a beautiful illustrated 
uh, kind of um, e- excerpts from um, uh, On Liberty that they, they want to distribute to kids, uh, high school kids, uh, college kids yeah. everywhere. It's quite a simple message too. It's not it's not abstruse, difficult philosophy. I mean, John Stuart Mill works it out very well in detail. It's very convincing and nicely done. But the basic message is not not difficult to understand. No, not at all. Maybe and maybe the label is more closely aligned with classical liberal. Something along those be. lines. Yeah, I do think it's. I do think that even the more vulgar type of libertarian, they do. They are subscribing to a, a basic value. I mean, it is very important principle that people should be free to do what they want to do. Right, right. right? And, that, and only under very special circumstances is, should that be in any way abrogated, limited, qualified. Right. Whatever. You know, it, it is a very fundamental principle. And sometimes I think people on the left who favor the concept of equality sometimes don't, don't realize that that can conflict with the principle of liberty. Right. Uh, equally important, and you have to coordinate the two things. It's not like, that's not an easy question. No, maybe, maybe that's the question of politics. Yeah, you coordinate the importance of equality with the importance of liberty. I think um, this is going to come up soon. I've been reading and doing a little bit of writing on this subject of when we colonize Mars, which looks like it's going to happen in our lifetime. You know, Elon wants to send a hundred people there, and then another hundred, and, and another hundred amongst the various obstacles they're going to face. Uh, is going to be, well, what kind of constitution do you set up? What set of rules do you have? Now, if, if it's a company, if it's just SpaceX, Inc., then I guess they can do whatever they want, uh, like a corporation would. But if it's not that, if it's, according to Space Treaty, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to own anything. So a corporation couldn't plant a flag and say, we own this spot of Mars. So it's some, some sort of a communal uh, society or something. Mm. Uh, mm. It would be like setting up in Idaho or Antarctica or something. It, it raises, again, the old question of, property rights because in on planet earth now every every piece of the planet is owned by somebody or other right but of course, in a relatively recent history that wasn't so there were no codified legal property rights at all right so you could go into huge whole continents and claim to own them so john stuart mill not no john, mill, john locke wrote about of course this issue of under what conditions does a person have property rights right and so go to other planets what is it? The first person who lands there can say, "I own this planet." <laughs> well, you know, there's a. Spa- I was looking into space law, and in 1966, uh, the UN agreed on uh, a resolution that no one can own any part of the moon or Mars. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure what you would do if a mining company went there and said, "Okay, we're going to exploit the the natural resources here." Um, well, can they make a profit off of that? Uh, I mean, are they leasing the land from who? The UN. All, all very good questions. Yeah. Locke's, Locke's view is this idea of mixing one's labor with the land. Right. It's reasonable, but it, it's very vague, you know, and it's obviously open to abuse because you get there first. I mean, basically, you get there first and you right. do a bit of labor mixing and it's yours. Well, as you know, Trump Trump That's formed the uh, the Space Force as an analog to the Air Force, and uh, so I don't know if you're going to send a rocket of a police armed police to say you can't have this land <laughs> in the name of what? I wonder what Trump would say if uh, it turned out there were a few Martians lurking up there. He said, <laughs> "We don't like immigrants in our." <laughs> We're going to kick you off, and we're going to separate you from your fam- separate your families. But we don't want immigrants to our planet. Right. You say, oh, fine, fine. <laughs> Interestingly, when my my guest a couple of weeks ago, Charles Cockell, an astrophysicist in England, uh, has has written a fair amount about liberty and space that that I hadn't th- realized anyone had given that much thought to, and and begins the problem begins with the, who owns the production of air. Because this isn't like Europeans coming to North America, where you got free air, free water, food is on the hoof and in the air. Uh, you're just fine if you, you know, put your labor to it. Uh, there's nothing like that on Mars. You, somebody has to start producing the air, and the moment that somebody has a monopoly on air production, then tyranny is going to be the result. They can control everything. Seems right. Yeah, it seems right. It's going to be those with the power when they get there are going to control everything. And there'll probably be Mars wars going on before <laughs> you know it. Would, conflicting, it'll be companies, you know, conflicting with each other about. So, it. so if you had to give a list of, of of books or documents for Elon to send along with his first colonists, besides John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, what would you recommend? For the for for them to read when they get to Mars. Yeah, to set up an, a Martian colony. 
and it would only be my favourite books. I'll give you a very eccentric choice just because I think they need, they need to make sure that civilization takes root there and not some awful, you know, right. uncivilized, bar barbarous, violent. They should read Zuleika Dobson by Max Beerbohm because mm. it's the height of civilization. I don't know whether you know much about it, but mm -mm. Max Beerbohm was a, an English writer at the same period as Oscar Wilde. At the time, he was an extremely celebrated figure. And um, he was a friend of Oscar Wilde, thought to be. He was he often. He was called by George uh, Bernard Shaw the incomparable Max, and he wrote many brilliant things, which are largely forgotten now, but even by quite sophisticated readers. Anyway, I happened to read. I'd read it so like a Dobson when I was a student in Oxford, but I, I happened to come across a review of work of his in the New York Review of Books, and I decided to read some of his work, and I read nearly all of it, and it's I recommend it to everybody. To pity it's forgotten. So Like a Dobson is a novel about a young woman who arrives in Oxford and is so magnetic, so beautiful, so irresistible, that every student falls in love with her, without exception. <laughs> uh, it's a fantasy, fairy tale kind of novel. <laughs> it's so well written, it's so funny. It's civilized in a way that seems now a distant memory because at that period, in you know London in that period, very civilized people. Hmm. Uh, so it's a bit, it would bring civilization, it would bring humor, it would bring beautiful writing. All these great qualities would be, and it's a, a nice, funny novel. Very interesting. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say the Bill of Rights or... <laughs> you strongly. It's a delightful read. Yeah, that's great. Well, listen, let's get right into it. Uh, by way of background for our listeners, uh, let me let me just sort of lay it out there that um, I write a monthly column for Scientific American. I've done 210 consecutive months now. So every month I got to come up with something new and different. So I'm just not repeating myself. And, uh, and I've kind of burned through all the old topics of is astrology true and are psychics real and are ghosts real, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I try to try to get into more uh, important topics. And um, I had just read uh, Steve Pinker's uh, new book, Enlightenment Now, where he has a discussion of the hard problem of consciousness. And I had just done a public event with Sam Harris in which we got into discussing free will. He's a determinist and I'm a compatibilist. And, and of course, I'm always talking about the God issue. So uh, I kind of put all those together, consciousness, free will, and God, and thinking about uh, it's you know scientific American science. Okay, so I remembered um, yeah the, the that um, uh, essay on the, you know that science is the art of the soluble, and uh, so it, to to what extent are are some issues just not soluble in a scientific sense? Maybe there you can resolve them through reason alone, through philosophy, or maybe not, but that science can't get at them and. Then I remembered the Mysterians. Uh, M Martin Gardner had first told me about the Mysterians. And then, of course, you and, and uh, Owen Flanagan, who I met at, uh, at, of all places, the Esalon Institute. And I remember he had talked about um, the, the Mysterians. And I thought, maybe this is one of these Mysterian mysteries, not, not just consciousness, but free will and God. Anyway, so I, I penned that. I only get 700 words up. So Naturally, a lot of professional philosophers, yourself included, um, thought that I had kind of misrepresented some of those terms or, uh, or the labels. And I, I do realize and, and acknowledge philosophers, um, you know, words are your data in a sense. You have to be very semantically precise with how you use words or else, you know, we're talking past each other. So I, I agree. Uh, so let's talk about that for a moment and then get into the ideas behind it because I'm, I'm less concerned about what the labels mean. So the, let, let's just start with the Mysterians. I always thought it was just um, that there are certain things that are insoluble, that, that cannot be explained on some deep level. N not, not because we haven't figured it out yet, like you know Newton couldn't understand relativity until I, you know, now Einstein comes along. It, it's not like that if we just had more knowledge. Uh, it's that there's something deeper, a conceptual problem, or um, we just don't have big enough brains, or or something like that. Give us the give us the kind of the potted explanation well, of what Mysterianism is. Well, you have to remember that the label Mysterian was invented by Owen Flanagan, who's not a Mysterian, and he was using it somewhat to make fun of those of us who believe in what's now called Mysterianism. I called the view in question in my book uh, Problems in Philosophy. Transcendental naturalism, mm -hmm. which it tells you a lot more. I've reluctantly taken up the phrase that because it's now become it's just a label for a position now. Right, it doesn't describe anything. Uh, if you try to take it too descriptively, it's not helpful. Okay, and it throws people off into mis into misconceptions about what people like me hold. 
Now, let's go back to Chomsky for a minute. Chomsky long ago distinguished between what he called problems and mysteries. Um, so a problem is just a, a question you can raise about nature, uh, which is in principle soluble by the human mind. Origins uh, of language or something like that. Yeah. Uh, many problems of science are going to be like that. Mysteries, as he understood it, were questions you can raise about nature which lie beyond human cognitive capacities. Now, the idea of this, of Chomsky's idea, and he used this, he illustrated it by giving examples from animals like a rat running a maze. He said, well, a rat can run a certain kind of maze, but it can't run a maze which says, you know, take a right turn at every prime number. Right. Can't do that. Well, he said, in the case of humans, we might have similar questions where our brains, our minds, are not have not evolved to be able to answer questions of a certain kind. So this is meant to be a very naturalistic position. So he's basically saying, Chomsky is saying, the human brain, just like any other animal brain, is evolved in a certain way, and it would be amazing if there were no limitations on it. And we know there are limitations in human cognition of various kinds, perceptual, memory, attention, lots of limits in human. So why would we ever assume that Everything about the universe that you can possibly ask a question about is something where you can answer that question. Uh, so, the more na the more scientific view I sometimes call my view scientific mysterianism. Uh, the more nat the more naturalistic scientific view would be let's be on the lookout for areas where the human intellect is having trouble and maybe running up against its limits. So now, would you would you distinguish between that and say it's just conceptually incoherent and we can't explain it that way so for example if our brain was yes. twice this big or ten times this big then maybe we could answer the question but what I'm saying is on the on this other uh, option m maybe no matter how big your brain is you'll never be able to answer it because it's it's poorly worded or it's it's an incorrect incorrectly phrased or something like well, that this uh, this is exactly what mysterianism is not not that idea okay there are incoherent ideas uh, they're not mysteries because the things that their ideas of don't exist. Round squares, right. immaterial spirits, uh, divine beings who live outside of space and time. Uh, many things you can list which philosophers are often interested in. Uh, things which subsist but don't, but don't exist. I'm talking about Meinong's ontology. There are many conceptual problems uh, that can be raised by various bits of language. Wittgenstein was very interested in language generating pseudo problems. Hmm. None of those falls into the category of mysteries as Chomsky means it or as I mean it. Right. it so what, what, what we mean is perfectly meaningful, coherent questions which we can't answer. Right. right. Not ones that are incoherent or confused. Right. I gotcha. So due yes. to the, due to the limit, limitations of human cognition. Right. That's so. The important point is it's epistemological. It's not semantic or logical in right. the sense that it's about a meaningless question, like a pseudo question, or a conceptual confusion or a contradiction. Not not that. Right. It's something where it's a perfectly meaningful question. Another type of being might be able to answer it, but in the case of just like with the rats, you see, perfectly meaningful instruction: take uh, take the left turn ev at every prime number. Not right. meaningless, not a right. conceptual problem, just the, rat, the rat's brain can't deal with it. So that's the idea of, that's what the idea is supposed to be. So when I say natu transcendental naturalism, there's naturalism is emphasized. Transcendental just means transcends, goes beyond right. the capacities that human beings happen to have at this point in evolutionary history. So say something like the hard problem of consciousness, what's it like to be... Uh, conscious or yourself or me or the bat or whatever in principle if our brains were twice this size or ten times this size we could answer this conceivably yes conceivably there are different strengths once you've got the basic idea there are different strengths of material mysterianism you can envisage so once one relatively small degree of mysterianism would be human beings with the brains that they now have at this point in evolutionary history can never solve problem so-and-so right Further one would be the human species could never evolve a brain big enough, uh, given the constraints on planet Earth. Right. Or are there any beings on other planets in the universe who might be able to solve the problem? Part of the mysterious position, again, Chomsky has this, is it's, it's a relative position. It's relative to a certain intellect where the problem is insoluble. 
So certain problems we find very easy, certain problems we find very difficult. Martians might find might have a, a, a reversal of those, where the problems we find difficult, they find easy. The problems we find easy, they find difficult. So eleven it's dimensional it, string it, theory may be so eleven well, dimension eleven dimensional string theory may be perfectly conceivable to some but some extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, or it may be uh, that uh, you go to the Martians, you visit the Martians, and they say. So what are your outstanding problems in science? And you say, well, mind-body problem. They say, really? <laughs> That's <laughs> easy. <laughs> right. What's the problem with that? And you can give substantive reasons why this might be the case because, and I've tried to do that in work of mine about the way our minds are very geared towards a spatial world. And so when we try to think about consciousness, it seems to elude spatial understanding. Right. So, but maybe the Martians don't, they're, they're not geared, their intellect's not geared towards a spatial world. Maybe they're, they're very different. And then, and then, but they may, may find very difficult things we find extremely easy. They may be like, like autistic people. We find it easy to understand human action. They may be utterly baffled by right. human. So, it's very, it's very, so it's a very naturalistic form of materialism. One of the things that's very important is it, mysteries are opposed to miracles. Right. Or the supernatural. That's why I would say, Transcendental naturalism. So the supernatural is not a mystery. Right. According to this view. It just doesn't exist. It exists. It could be a mystery, but not necessarily. It might be or it might not be. Some people have thought that God, those who think that God exists. Some people have thought that God is a mystery. Some have not thought he's not a mystery. Yeah. My own view of this is that if God were to exist, he would be less of a mystery than human beings. Right. So this is my... Uh, it, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a strange combination of the material and the immaterial, the way we are. See, I claim that there's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal. Right. And, and my example is, let, let's take something like the, you know, the Penrose, Stuart Hameroff uh, idea of, of these uh, uh, inside neurons are these microtubules, and inside the microtubules you get these quantum effects. So you get the collapse of the wave function, and, uh, and, and therefore... You can get spooky action at a distance um, uh, between brains or between a brain and some uh, external substance. And so they're open to the idea that uh, you could have telepathy, uh, that two minds could read each other if their somehow wave functions were collapsing in unison, so, something like that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm skeptical of this particular theory, yeah, but, 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 if it, but, but if it turned out to be true, that would no longer be ESP, paranormal, supernatural. It would just be a branch of physics, quantum physics and, yeah. and uh, co cognitive studies yeah. or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. Again, I don't believe in any in the supernatural. I don't think it's even a meaningful concept. Partly for the reasons you just gave. If something turned out to be real, it would be natural. There's no distinction between those right. two things. Certain things that have been discovered in physics would have been thought by people beforehand to be supernatural. In fact, were thought that way. Right. Most things, one being Newton's gravitational force. Right. But the early the mechanists, the Cartesians, said. It's a spooky, and of course, new right. things is occult. It's a spooky force. It's not physical. So we can't have it in our physics. Well, it turned out that they incorporated it into the physics, and, and that's okay. Now, it's still somewhat mysterious. It is. It is. But it's not miraculous, because the concept of a miracle is a meaningless concept, <laughs> really. My, uh, it's, it's only defined negatively as a miracle is what's not natural. Right. What is that? Right. So, so we don't want to use mysterianism in application to alleged supernatural things like gods or angels or anything, or telepathy or astrology or anything like that. That is completely outside of the domain of what can be a mystery, in the in the sense in which we're interested. Right. In it. That's right. If That's there right. were such things, they'd be miracles, and I suppose to that degree they'd be mysterious. But we're not interested in that. No. Uh, in, in the same way that I threw God into the into the pile there, because I'm often challenged. All right, Shermer, what would it take for you to believe in God? What what evidence would you accept? And of course, I go through the you know the Woody Allen you know a ten million dollar cash deposit in a Swiss bank and, under my name, uh, or you know making the Statue of Liberty disappear where Copperfield, Copperfield can do that, or catch bullets in your teeth. Well, Penn and Teller could do that. You know, even you know a, a scrolled you know Michael Shermer, it's me Jesus in the sky. Well, you know some magician could do this. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine anything that would be evidence. And if it was something like, well, 
um, uh, curing cancer, uh, or, you know, some m- miracle, like walking on water. Well, again, I've seen Penn and Teller walk on water. You know, they use some natural device. And even if it was something really far advanced, I could imagine an extraterrestrial intelligence quite able to do genetic engineering, creating life forms. Even as science fiction writers project, you could create planets, you could create new universes out of collapsing black holes. You, you cause a, a star that's big enough to collapse into a black hole and out of that maybe bubbles out a new universe if singularity theory about how universes are formed turns out to be true. Then even the creation, so the creation of universes, planets, life, you know, genes and so on, and even consciousness could all be done by a sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence. So all the attributes we give to God that most believers give to God seem to me indistinguishable from a sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial. So we're still just talking about a natural being. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of agree with the gist of what you're saying, but I, I'm not sure I agree, though, that there's nothing that for me would count as evidence for the existence of a being. Now, it might turn out to be an extraterrestrial, a being whose existence had hitherto not been recognized uh, as many of the attributes of the traditional concept of God. So you gave examples of things where somebody walked on water or there was writing in the sky and this could all be done by somebody else. It could all be done, but if we investigated it and found that there was no other explanation at all that could be given for any of it, and it was repeating itself constantly and it was intersubjective and it was contrary to everything we'd observed before, I would certainly start thinking there's more in the universe than we really thought was in the universe. Mm -hmm. What what to me is the much more telling point is no such thing has ever happened. (laughs) Right. If there were such a thing as a god or something in the universe, there should be an indication of it, but there is no indication of it whatsoever. The things which have been cited by religion are never, they always have other explanations. But if something came along which did not have any other explanation, I wouldn't say, well, it can't be evidence for God. I'd say, now on the face of it is, let me look into this further. Now, it wouldn't tell you the nature of that being. It wouldn't necessarily mean, oh, so the Christian God has been vindicated. Just turn out there's something out there, and it's an intelligence and it's beyond what we supposed. My, the most likely explanation in my mind would be it's an extraterrestrial. Yeah, well, as you know, Christians often argue that the resurrection uh, is is provable in that sense. The 500 witnesses saw Jesus after his death, the t- empty tomb, the three eyewitness women that were there when they rolled back the tomb. Yeah. And, yeah, you reject all those. Yeah, completely, oh yeah. Well, one thing about it is it said now there were 500 witnesses. Right. Well, what's the evidence that there were 500 witnesses? Well, there's one account that says there were 500 people. There's an account of it. So right. there's a witness who says there were those witnesses. Really? So there were those witnesses? <laughs> right. I'm very doubtful there were any such right. witnesses. I mean, of course, I, and I'm partly doubtful because there can't be such a thing as resurrection. It's not possible in the natural world. Right. So I'm not going to take it seriously that there is. If, you, if it was happening all the time, Right. If you, then I'd say, oh, turns out, but it doesn't happen all the time. It's, I don't know if you know Frank Tipler's book. Uh, the, the, do you know Frank Tipler's book, The Physics of Immortality? Then he did another one, The Physics of Christianity. He's a no, physicist. No, physicist. No, He's a physicist at Tulane University, so he's the guy that he, he, he first climbed on to the anthrop- anthropic cosmological principle with uh, Barlow. Uh, so that was their first book. Then he did The Physics of Immortality, which he talked about the omega point, that in the far future of the universe, uh, there'll be enough uh, energy to produce a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from our reality, and therefore you could resurrect everyone who ever lived or ever could have lived, and he just goes on and on. And that's God. The omega point is God. Then his third book, The Physics of Christianity. He actually went into the resurrection. This was Jesus' body was converted to neutrinos, and the neutrinos pushed down and pu- pushed his body up into heaven. Tremendous rubbish, right? <laughs> Complete rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> well, yes. My physics, my physics <laughs> friends tell me it's total That's rubbish. Religious physics, you know. Right, right. right. But something like that, you'd be, uh, you would answer the question if someone said, "All right, Colin, what would it take for you to believe in God?" It would be something like what I just described, but repeatable, that you could put in a lab and yeah, test. It's very, it's very important that it's not some incident which is, the, it, it, you're only believing because of hearsay that happened long ago with a, group, a limited group of people who are not here now to be questioned, and somehow it never gets repeated by any other time. It's just this unique event. It's all very convenient from the point of view of verification. Right. I mean, everything we can we believe, and we know that people are fallible in what they think happens constantly. Right. They're, right. they're deceptive, intentionally deceptive. Those explanations are far more likely than 
the one that the the credulous right tends to assign to it he saw somebody walk on water or ascend into the heavens there's right. never it's just not good enough evidence if right. i saw somebody ascending to the heavens i'd say oh <laughs> this looks uh, interesting right if an angel visited me at night i would be i'd say oh very interesting i would you know I'd, and there'd be other explanations come to my mind have i taken a drug was i asleep i don't i'd want to rule those out right but if I did rule them out, I'd say, well, 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 that's amazing. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, this brings up an interesting um, uh, thought experiment that that may not be for me if I t- take up this invitation that will get, get us into consciousness. That is, I have an invitation to go to this place in Costa Rica and do ayahuasca for a week and take these trips into these other dimensions. Now, the people inviting me are 100% convinced there's this other world that you can go to that's supernatural parent whatever uh and that the only way to get there is you got to do the ayahuasca and um uh, so let's say i do this and you know i come overcome the you know have to puke your guts out for three hours a day and all that stuff part of the purging <laughs> oh. process but let's oh. go, and i come back and say uh colin you're not going to believe this i went to this place colors were so rich and vibrant and the sounds and everybody was beautiful and i saw these incredible creatures you of course would say yeah but that's an, that's purely subjective internal state uh how can i verify it and i say come on down to costa Rica and take the ayahuasca and you'll see it to me i'd say interesting now again even if it happened to me i might say well i could just be under the influence of a drug so i'd want to know if i've taken any drugs recently and I'd want to ex- exclude various possibilities. It would depend on the quality of the experience I had, how convincing was it. But I, I wouldn't immediately say, oh, then there is this other place. I'd want to rule out the alternatives. But I wouldn't dogmatically say that nothing could ever persuade me right. or even incline me to think there was such a thing. It, something could, in principle, persuade me of it. It's just I don't think it's likely. Right. You know, it's just so unlikely because I know that these things are believed in by people when they're not the case. The human human beings beliefs are ninety percent of the time false. Right. I mean, so <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, the, the, but the problem is, how do we get around the subjective experience? If if it's only ever you have to do it yourself, and then you'll see uh, how just do we? Only, just not only that. If other people went down with you, and I thought they were respectable people who were you know not not sold their souls to this religion, and right. you know, and they all started telling me. And they and they, they and they try to do some scientific observations. I might start thinking this is getting pretty credible now. I don't I don't insist that I have to do it. Right. I, just like I don't insist that scientists, I don't have to verify their results personally. I just believe in scientists as a group, on have, good grounds. Have you read much on near death experiences? Because this is what the, the claimants make people, is that people always talk communicating with me about it, sending me proofs of near death experiences, and you know. I, I'm not interested in it because I think it's all very hard to believe. I don't understand why it would be the case. It seems obviously just to be an effect of the brain in some abnormal condition. It wouldn't prove anything to do with heaven or anything like that. Right. The brain can do some weird things. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, one of my comebacks is you know, read Oliver Sacks. You know, every chapter oh, in every yeah. book is some weird thing that yeah, you well, just yeah. can't believe somebody thinks is true. That, but that, that, then you look in the brain, and there's a little neurological hiccup in there. And it's a good argument. Yeah, the brain is you know the brain is a system that can easily have a breakdown, and, and it has breakdowns. Even in our ordinary experience, we have experience of illusions all the time. We make mistakes about things all the time. The brain is very fallible. Right. So that's what you've always got to bear in mind when somebody comes out with something amazingly right. surprising. Right. right, right. Are you sure <laughs> you're not making a mistake? And yeah. They often make sure and they, yeah. So you're arguing for epistemological humility, that there's just so much we don't know. And yes. uh, so with the Mysterian, you, what you mean by the Mysterian position is, is this epistemological humility? We just, we don't know uh, because our brains are limited. But so, so you can't say you can't be a, a nihilist in this sense. You want to just say, I don't I don't believe, but I'm open to some possibilities in the future. Right. right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 humility, but not that somebody. It's not like a skeptic, you see, who says, well, we don't know anything. Right. Of course, we I, I think we know lots of things. Right. Science is perfectly solid. Right. And we know lots of other things apart from science as well. Um what what I am particularly wanting to resist is the inference from X is mysterious to X doesn't exist. Right. That's the bad thing, and that that's a tendency that arises from verificationism 
in philosophy, positivism. So you don't say God doesn't exist. You just say there's no reason to believe that God exists. No, I say God doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, God doesn't exist because it's any more than Santa Claus exists. Okay. All right. All right. God doesn't exist. But I'm not going to reason like this, as some philosophers have. Consciousness is mysterious. Therefore, there's no such thing as consciousness. Right. The answer to that is, yes, there is such a thing as consciousness. I know that perfectly well. It's just that I know it's mysterious. And there are lots of things like that. I mean, I, can, I have a long list of things I've written down for you of all <laughs> the things I think are mysterious, uh, which all exist. Okay. You want me to tell you what it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice combination because I've added some in recent years. Okay. You know, maybe one of, them I've even, one of them I've maybe partially subtracted from the list. But Okay. So in my book, you mentioned inborn knowledge. I claim there that innate ideas are mysterious. There are innate ideas. The nativists are right, but they're mysterious. It's a mysterious how the genes can encode uh, the idea of red, for instance. Hmm. That's a mystery, how, we, how the genes can, how that idea ever arose in evolutionary history, how the genes pass it on from one person to another. So that's one of the things. I think that matter is mysterious. Now this is something, it's in another book of mine, uh, Basic Structures of Reality. This is a rather old idea, actually, that matter is mysterious. And even in the 17th century, it was a quite a common view so the idea there was, in the 20th too, there's a view that we only know the structural or functional and functional properties of matter and mathematical properties. We don't know the intrinsic nature of matter, how it is in itself. You mean, you mean why it exists at all? Why any material no, stuff? No. Is, what, is, what its nature is. Okay. What is matter? Because all we know about it is its structural mathematical features, not what it actually is. So that's why there was a, was and still is, a school of thought that says that matter is really mind. So Russell had a view like this, or neutral monism. Why, why isn't an answer just, it's made of atoms, and these atoms have the, this many new, uh, uh, electrons and protons and neutrons. That's what it, that's its inherent we, that stuff. Doesn't, it doesn't tell us what the atoms are made of. Well, they're made of quarks. It doesn't tell us what the quarks are made of. They're made so of strings. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't tell us what those are made of. <laughs> okay. The, 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 but the argument is not just boringly saying, oh, we, we have to know more. The argument is, when you look at the physics of it, the only properties ever ascribed to these entities are purely abstract properties. So the, the, uh, let me try to illustrate what yeah. people have in mind. In the case of my own consciousness, I'm not limited only to abstract properties of my own consciousness. I know what it's like intrinsically. I know what consciousness is from my, from my own case. But in the case of matter, when it's described in physics, I don't have that acquaintance with matter. Hmm. What I have is abstract descriptions of things called atoms, electrons, and so forth. And those are only characterized in these abstract mathematical terms. And that is true of physics. They only have, another way of putting it, their only dispositions are attributed to them. They exert certain forces, have certain effects in certain conditions. But if you ask a physicist, well, I, you told me what the electron does. I want to know what it is. He said, well, I don't know what it is. Well, it, it's energy. But that's another that's, abstract idea. What's energy, too, you see? What is energy? So in the philosophy of physics, there are questions about what are these ultimate things in physics? We don't really know. We just have, we say what energy does. You know, energy in physics is usually called, characterized by what they call work. Yeah. Work done. I mean, that's a functional kind of property. What but you don't go so far as to say it's, uh, it, it all comes down to pure consciousness or mind. They're just no, pure ideas. Some, some people have. Because yeah. what they've argued is, like Russell and Eddington, who's a physicist, of course, well, it's got to have some intrinsic nature. Uh, maybe the intrinsic nature of it is somehow mental. So you get panpsychism. Yep. yep. And so people like David Chalmers take it very seriously. I take it seriously as a theoretical option. I don't believe it for a minute, but mm -hmm. I take it seriously. My own view about this is we don't know what matter is. <laughs> so it should be okay to just leave it at that. Uh, we don't know. We Keep don't working know. on it. Maybe but but at some point, is there a, again, you're going to run into, well, this is what you're arguing, I think. We're going to run into conceptual, or not conceptual, a cognitive limitations on getting at that particular question. You can yeah. take the strings all the way down to pure energy, right. but right. to make the leap over to it's just mind or something like that right. isn't really going to get us there. Yeah. Well, that's what, one of the reasons that people do that is they don't want to accept ultimate mystery. So they say, no matter isn't mysterious, it's mind. And we know what mind is. So that's so we all can feel happier. Okay. But now the universe isn't mysterious. Right. Well, that's what. Uh, next, yeah, yeah. Next thing on the list, causation. Yep. Okay. So this is go back to Hume. Yep. Causation. So uh, as you very well argued, we don't have any adequate ideas of causal necessity. One thing so happens, then another thing happens. That's all you know. 
We know constant conjunction. Right. We don't know what causal necessity is. It's it's inscrutable. And that was one of, and I think that he's probably right about that. Meaning is another well, one. Well, wait, wait, before you blow past that, uh, the billiard bar, ball hits the other billiard bar, ball. The infant instantly gets. There's a causal connection there. That's some innate knowledge that that in, infants are born with. So physical contact. What's wrong with that is because at least one you, form as you, of... As Hume pointed out, we don't have any... The infant doesn't have any perception of necessity. The infant sees the one billiard ball hit another, and then it sees the effect. What it doesn't... What it can't do is predict a priori from properties of the, of the first billiard ball what effect it will have. So as Hume says, we only know causal relations by experience. Hmm. But he thinks that causal powers which exist in the first billiard ball do determine of necessity what the effects are going to be. But we don't have any access to those causal powers. We don't know what we don't have any perception of them, any idea of them. Now, so we in, have to rely on experience. In how the mind works, Pinker argues from the bottom up that in a if you evolve an organism that evolves in a three dimensional world in which gravity has certain predictable effects, they're going to evolve brains that find causality related to that particular physical system. And that's true. We were able to we were able to detect causal connections via constant conjunctions. That was Hume's position. Right. But the reality of causation is not constant conjunction. The reality is causal necessity or causal powers in objects. But we don't have access to that power. So powers are mysterious to us, according to Hume. Right. We, we, we know that they're there. So Hume says, well, we know there were causal powers in the universe, called it the cement of the universe. We don't have any ideas of them. And that's why we can't make a prediction from knowledge of the cause to knowledge of the effect. We can only, we only infer backwards from seeing what the... Uh, actual effects of a cause are right the constant, constant conjunctions now some people have thought that Hume's view is that causal connection is constant conjunction that's not his view that's not that's a reductive empiricist okay. view. his view is that there is constant conjunction there is causal necessity they're not the same thing but our only evidence for causal necessity is constant conjunction but that's not what causal necessity is. Okay. What about the scientific attempt to control for intervening variables, and you've controlled all the variables, and this is the last one that's left that could cause it, or in experiments where you, you have a control group and an experimental group, and so you're manipulating the conditions so that only one thing could actually be the cause, and therefore the inference to the best cause is X, and we conclude that. We have, not, we have causal knowledge. The but, question is, what's it based on? The question is, how does our knowledge arise, on the one hand, versus... What's the reality of yeah, causation? Yeah, on the other hand, yeah. Obje the objective reality of it is necessity in objects, not co not constant conjunction. Yeah. Okay. Right. But when we know about <laughs> causation, we only know about it via constant conjunction. So we know about it indirectly. We don't know about it directly. So, so we don't really have, as he says, an adequate idea of causal necessity or power or anything like that. What we have is an indirect knowledge. It's a little bit like, just to give an analogy, a little bit like, I know that you have various mental states, but I don't have direct acquaintance with your mental states. Right. I infer them from something extrinsic to them themselves. Right. So he thought this happened a lot. And he thought this was the case for causal necessity. You're, so what people think, they think they're perceiving causation itself, but just as people might naively think, I'm perceiving your mind itself, but that's not right. I'm inferring it from something else. Right, and you could, well, so that gets to this hard problem, that, or, or at least this other problem of the bat that we can get into. But but, but before we do that, let's just go through some of your other. Th these are mysteries uh, that we cannot currently solve, but in principle with a, a different kind of brain or, a, 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 well, or, or perhaps, so, so, perhaps an AI could figure out. There are different strengths of position. Some, some might be that certain of these questions could never be solved by any sentient being. Any right. finite sentient being, right. you can have any you can have any number of different gradations of how strong the thesis is. In each of these, I will give you a different answer to what I think about how mysterious they are. Right. Some of them are super mysterious, right? Ultimately mysterious. Some of them are pretty strongly mysterious. Others are probably soluble in principle, even by the human brain, if it were to change in various ways. You know. You want, to, you want to get this? Uh, let's just do the list. We need. We could discuss each of them. For yeah, go ahead. Just right, rifle through the list here. Just do the list. Meaning is another one, and that's also been discussed a lot by philosophers, because it's very difficult to say what meaning, what constitutes meaning. And so, if you know anything about Saul Kripke's book about Wittgenstein, he, he argued in there that 
we can't say what kind of fact constitutes meaning. Mm -hmm. So one, one response would be there's no such thing as meaning because we can't say what kind of fact constitutes it. Another would be there is a fact about meaning, but it's a mystery. So is, the, is this, this a, also not just obviously a, a, a restriction of our language? What, what, how we define words to mean certain things, and, and, that, and that restricts our cognition. You know, yeah. Wittgenstein's well, whole thing on language and cognition, it's, you know, there's, there's only certain things we can know, just how we think about them or talk about them. Right. Well, we know, what, we know what our words mean, but the question is, do we know the nature of meaning, what kind of thing meaning is, or what kind of thing understanding a word is, or following mm -hmm. a rule, if we're going to put it in Wittgenstein's way. Uh, you know, the idea is like, is a meaning an image? Mm -hmm. Is it a picture? Is it a disposition to use words in a certain way? Mm -hmm. Different theories that philosophers have had about what meaning mm -hmm. is. None of them work. Right. So one possibility, is, and Quine took the view that there is no such thing as meaning. It's just a, it's a it's a piece of antiquated right. Nothing. There's just meaning is a myth. What do you think? I think the meaning is exists, but it's mysterious. We okay. don't know what it is. Right. I have a paper arguing for this position too. Uh, I think that knowledge is a problem. The knowledge of mathematics is the most, is the one that's often discussed by philosophers. How do we know about abstract entities? Mm -hmm. Because there are no causal connections between abstract entities and human minds. So how do we know about numbers? So you'd put, it's presumably you'd put the laws of nature in there. These mathematical descriptions of things that stars well, do say. Yeah, if they're mathematical, they'll go in there. Yeah, depending how we think of laws, but if they're mathematical. I mean, it goes back to Plato, this, because Plato's idea of the abstract world of universals raises the question, well, how do we know about this world? How do we, how do we make cognitive contact with the world of universals? That's a, that's a problem for Plato. I mean, it seems to me if you say a, a verbal description, this is what stars do, uh, they convert hydrogen into helium under certain temperatures and pressures and depending on their size and so forth, and you write that all down mathematically, and that's called a law, but it's really just a description of what matter does under these conditions. Yeah. Call it whatever you want, but it's... I'm, I'm, I'm talking not so much about laws, mathematical laws of the empirical world, but pure mathematics. How do we know truths about number, mm -hmm. which is the thing that, that uh, Plato was interested in? And the problem, this is a problem raised by, initially, the philosopher Banasaraf, Paul Banasaraf of Princeton, had a famous paper about the, diff the epistemological problem raised by Platonism, that we, there's no coherent story you can tell about how the human mind or brain could ever be in contact with entities which, according to the Platonist view, are outside space and time. That's but, a mystery. But again, <laughs> as, a, as a Mysterian, maybe there's some extraterrestrial intelligence with uh, brains ten times our size, and they evolved in a planet with very different physics than ours, say, yeah. and, and they would have no problem with this. Yeah, yeah. They may, they, they, may be, they may say, oh, that's no difficulty with that. Here's how it works. You've got this entity outside space and time. You've got this brain inside space and time. And blah, 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 blah. And then, <laughs> now it doesn't make any sense to us. And we say, what, what, what? And they say, do I need to repeat it? You, well, I get it. <laughs> and they think, oh, they're limited. They're very limited. Right. Like you trying to self, explain it to your dog. Right, exactly. The self is another one. Now, you'd predict the self to be because consciousness, so there's the self. The unconscious, this is an interesting change of mind, of my, not change of mind in my mind, but it, it's sort of the enlargement of the position. I think the unconscious is also a mystery as well as consciousness. So now I don't think it's right to say, as Nagel did or as I did too, it's consciousness that makes the mind-body problem a hard problem. I think unconscious mental states are e not equally hard, but they're hard. Mm -hmm. And the, the same arguments which are used against materialism for the conscious apply against the unconscious. So again, I have a paper about this as well. I think that color is a, I've come to think that color is a problem, where color comes from. The colors themselves, not color experiences, because they don't come from the, the physical world. There are no colors in the physical world. Mm -hmm. Where do they come from? They come from the mind somehow. Mm -hmm. How does the mind generate colors? From where? Mm -hmm. Inside itself? How? Mind isn't colored. It comes from somewhere, so, I don't, so color is a problem. So when, when, when someone like Christoph Koch says, look, I can show you right here in the visual cortex in V15X and these 237 neurons, they fire when I show the monkey red. You'll, just, you'll say, well, those are just neurons swapping neurochemical transmitters. That, that's, really the, a question, that's really a question more about the experience of red rather than red itself. Now, there's an, another issue in it, what the relationship is between experiences of red and red. 
But a red is a quality of objects, of course, whereas experiences are properties of subjects of experience. Mm -hmm. So there's the question of how do colors come into the world? They don't come in. Shapes come into the world because objects are shaped. We don't have any difficulty explaining why there are shapes in the world. Right. But you can't give that explanation of why how colors come into the world. So if I if I hold colored. up the the rock here and well, so you're okay with the shape, but the color of beige or whatever that's the mystery. It's a mystery how it comes into the world. Yeah, where it comes from, where the color comes from. Now the obvious answer is it's projected by the mind, and that's the classic answer. Right. So shapes come from the world, colors come from the mind. And now how do they get it back into the world? Well, the mind projects them onto the world. Okay. So now we've got this classic theory about how colors come to exist. They are a projection of the perceptual system. The problem with that is it's a mystery what this projection is. What mm. does it mean? How does the mind project colors onto the world? That's just a metaphor. Mm. So it's all very mysterious what's going on when we see something as red. Where does the quality come from? We have to come. So when we have an experience of red, we have an experience of a certain quality. So we shouldn't assimilate that quality just to the experience, even if somehow the quality depends on the experience. It's not the same thing as that. So this is very, very philosophically very troubling. So you, 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 you put color into a different category than shape. Well, that's the classic. The, the, the old idea, going back to Descartes and Locke, is the difference between primary and secondary qualities. And their idea was primary qualities are shape, number, duration, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Secondary qualities are taste, sound, right, color, yeah, okay. right. and so forth. And then they thought one's subjective and one's objective. And so I'm saying there are mysteries associated with, with yep, all of that, okay. too. Now, I want to make another, another distinction about how extensive the idea of mystery might be. Again, I'm talking about my more recent unpublished thoughts, which I, I like to do, you see, because they're not already out there. <laughs> um, a natural view, I think the view I used to hold, was that mis mystery is partial. That is, certain pockets of nature are mysterious. But not every pocket of nature is mysterious, because after all, we do know quite a bit about nature. Not everything is mysterious. But there is room for another position, which is, uh, is a form of global total mysterianism, which goes as follows. Everything is mysterious in some aspect or other, but not in every aspect. So if I take just a material, an ordinary material object and go back to what I was saying earlier, yeah. there's nothing mysterious about, well, on the face of it, there's nothing mysterious about the computer in front of me being square, right, or having a certain mass, or having electric charge. I mean, those things are, I'm hesitating a little bit because electric charge is quite mysterious, but but if, if we accept what I was saying earlier about matter and energy being mysterious, well, even this computer is mysterious in one of its aspects, that it's material, it's made of matter, we don't know what that is. So it may be that every single thing in the world is mysterious in some respect. Mm -hmm. So the shape would not be, but the color would be, something like that. Be, or, may, or the fact that it's made of matter, because we don't know what matter is. Right. It's mysterious what it ultimately con constitutes. Right. Physical things. And it may be they may be mysterious in in, other, in certain other ways too, particularly questions of origin. Everything is see. There's, a, there's always the question of the origin of the universe. So all bits of matter are mysterious as to their origin, because the Big Bang, of course, is you know it raises the obvious right. what happened before that. Right, right, and right. We may never answer that question. So. Right. There'll always be a regress to another stage, and you can just ask one more question. So it may be that mystery is actually spread over all of nature. Is that on your list, the origins of the universe, or or it why is, there is something rather than nothing? Yeah, it is. It's, but that, that I think of as a scientific mystery. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but, but, be, you know, but maybe I mean, scientific. Vic Stanger used to rephrase it, why should there be nothing rather than something? Maybe something is the natural state of things and nothing would be mysterious. I think the, the problem with the Big Bang is it's very much a scientific issue. We're told that there was this... Extre exceedingly small point to singularity containing this massive amount of energy it's superheated beyond anything that currently in the universe okay you know let's uh, let's accept it did that come from nothing right wasn't there a cause of it if so it needed to have properties which would be able to produce that singularity in the end with that temperature so this See, when, 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 co when cosmologists use that word nothing they don't mean it in the same way I think a philosopher or a theologian I mean they they talk about uh, virtual particles are existing yeah, that, in the nothing yeah and that and that they quantum foam fluctuations create yeah. say electrons out of 
uh, nothing, or, or sorry, that, that say, for example, a photon of light comes out of the atom when there's a change in the electron's orbit, but the, the photon did not exist in the atom. It, it, it came out of nothing. Well, in one way you can say it, say it that way, but it does come out of the atom, and the atom pre-existed the, existent, the photon that comes out of it. Uh, sometimes physicists use nothing just to mean non-material things, right. which is a very bad usage. That's why, you know, to say to say, well, we're explaining how the universe came from nothing, and it turns out that the, the nothing consists of all sorts of things like energies and quantum states. Right. That's not nothing. Right. <laughs> so. But but it, no matter what you think about the, the question of nothing, let's put even put that one on one side. Uh, unless you think that the the Big Bang and the singularity just popped into existence from no, from nowhere, unless you think that it had a history, it had an antecedent mm -hmm. state of affairs, which caused it. Now the point about this is, let's suppose that's true, and many physicists now are coming to see that that's true. That that it, it, there's a real question about the, what the antecedent state of the universe was. Is it knowable? Maybe mm -hmm. not. Right. It's very hard to know about the Big Bang. It's a sheer fluke that we know about the Big Bang. Right. All the all the most plausible. It just happens that there was radiation left afterwards, and it was preserved. It might not have been. It could have been gone. And if we live in a multiverse, then all those other universes they're inaccessible to us. It's also a very good example. I was going to give again. It's a mystery. Don't we may never find out whether that's true. Uh, about what multiverse because in, in, in one version of the multiverse we cannot get uh, access to any of the other universes yeah, so we might not find out we just might not ever find out whether any of the universes see this is where my theologian opponents say aha you see this is science just uh, practicing faith you're just saying this you're just making this story up well, well they, they, they're getting the, the point wrong you see because this is this is sign this is us saying we can't believe things on faith. What we must say about these things is not we believe on faith that something preceded the Big Bang. You know, we say, no, we just don't know it. Yeah, we just don't know, yeah. It's just a question of ignorance. We should never misconstrue ignorance as knowledge of the supernatural. Right, right. It just is ignorance. And now, what, you, and then what you've got to, as I say at the very beginning of this discussion, the essential point is to see how naturalistic this view is. The human brain evolved in a certain period, right? Nobody thinks that the brains of other species are omniscient. Why would we think our brains are omniscient? Of course they're not omniscient. Right. They're limited. Right. Of course it's not easy for us to see that because they are limited. But if you look at it in a more, you know, from a more abstract perspective, they must be limited. And if you find areas of human inquiry where we're running up against serious problems, maybe it's because we're running up against the limits of our intelligence. You can never be dogmatic about it, you know, you right. can't. You can't be sure, but it's it's certainly possible. Maybe a brain the size of Jupiter could get us all the way back to three universes ago, but not before that. That would be good. That's a good. <laughs> I like the way of thinking about it because it's very naturalistic, right? You you get a human brain composed of human neurons, make it precisely three times as big as Jupiter. It will give you knowledge of exactly this many billion years ago, but not any further. <laughs> that seems to be the way it works. Right. That's how brains work. Right. Yep. <laughs> so what? Uh, let, any others on your list? Those are that's that's quite those a few big are, ones. Those are the, one, the main ones I wanted to bring up uh, as a list of things. Well, let's let's, of, let's let's get back to the consciousness one because that that I think yeah. is, is super interesting. Um, as I conceived of it, and maybe I have it wrong, the whole idea of what's it like to be a bat. Uh, the way Steve Pinker and I conceptualized this was that, and I think Steve put it well with his. It's based on this conceptual flaw that the little homunculus in my brain leaps over to yours to see what your red looks like, and now I can know what 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 you are thinking or feeling or whatever. That's obviously not possible, and therefore it's a conceptual error. And and you're saying no, that's not really what the what it's like to be a bat means. I always think of it as like, well, if I layered on some echolocation and some wings, I'd have kind of a general idea of what it feels like to be a bat. But I, I would just be a human just projecting myself into batdom, I would not really be a bat. You see, what you're saying is not off the mark in, in the sense that that does come up in Nagel's paper, but it, what it misunderstands is what the role of that in the argument is and what the argument actually is that that occurs in. So okay. let me try to get it across to you. Yeah. Very, the, I, the paper is not that easy to read. Yeah. It's, I know. it's deceptively easy to read. I think easy. a lot of us read it by the title. Yes, and people latch on to the bat 
thing, you see, and they, because they all understand the back thing. But the abstract argument that that's meant to be a part of, and it's not even an essential part of it. It's just a heuristic, that bat thing. Tom Nagel said this to me recently, but I was discussing it with him. He said, well, that's just a heuristic. That's not meant to be. Okay, now here's, the, here's what he said. Let me try to get the essential point across. Certainly, it's got nothing to do with the idea that we can't imagine our way to having bat experiences. That would be crazy, that idea. Of course, you can't imagine your way to having bat experiences. Nobody can. I can't imagine my way to having experiences I don't have. <laughs> right. Blind man can't imagine his way to having visual experience. No, it's not possible as a way to get experience. You have to have the sense in question to do it. Right. Nagel's point is this. The only way to have a concept of a type of experience is by having that type of experience. That sounds like the same the thing. Way, the only way to have the concept of a type of experience is by having the type of experience. Okay. So in the case of the bat, why is it we, we realize we don't have the concept of a bat's experience? Why not? Because we don't have bat experiences. It doesn't tell you that we can't have bat experiences. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. That's not the point. The point is, the only way we can have the concept is by having the experiences. You've got to see the contrast case, because he's talking about subjective versus objective in that paper. Suppose I take the concept, if we take the concept of shape, let's take square, cubicle, something like that. I have the concept of cubicle. I don't have to be cubicle have the concept of cubicle, right? I have the concept of a bat. I have the concept of an elephant or a mouse. I don't have to be a bat or an elephant or a mouse. I have the concept of those things. Okay. Those are physical, objective things. But what distinguishes experience, according to Nagel, is that I can only know what that property is, having an experience of a certain type, by having that kind of experience. That sounds okay. like the same thing I I said. No? Okay. <laughs> no, so, so it's not saying there's some difficulty about humans ever having the experience of a bat. Okay. They, in fact, it's easy to have the experience of a bat. All you need to do is put into our brains the relevant cortical machinery that bats have in their brain, and you'd have experience of a bat. So what? It doesn't matter to the argument. Okay. So now we would know what it's like to be a bat if we had the experiences ourselves. There'd still be that asymmetry, that contrast between the case of square, or the case of being a bat or an elephant, versus having a certain type of experience. Oh, okay. I so see. That's what's crucial to the argument is, given that contrast between the two kinds of concepts, it's not possible to explain subjective concepts by means of objective concepts, because they're completely different kinds of I see. Okay. Concepts. Got it. Right. Let's take the blind man and makes the point just as clearly as the bat. That's why the bat isn't essential. Right. A blind man can't have the concept of experiences of color or any kind of, any kind of visual experience. It doesn't mean we're not saying that is why he's blind, right? While not having the experience, he can't have the concept of those things. Of course, he could gain his sight, and then he'd have the concept. They wouldn't stop him being human or anything. He just he would have it. But the only way he's going to get the concept of an, a visual experience is by having visual experiences. But you can have the concept of an eye or a nose or without having having those things, right? They're objective things. Right. So Nagel's point is, certain concepts you can only have by occupying a certain what he calls point of view. The point of view is a sensory point of view. So re really what it means is, the only way you can have the concept of a bat's experience is by having the point of view of a bat, that is to say bat's experiences. But then the argument, the argument then is, yeah, but I can know all about the bat's brain without having a bat's brain, but then how, is, how could it be that the bat's experience is reducible to the concepts you'd use to characterize the bat's brain, because they're very different kinds of concepts. Right. One's an objective, one's a subjective. That's the, that's the point. So it isn't to do with trying to argue that we can or can't have experiences like bats. It doesn't, it's not relevant to the question. Okay. Have I got it? Have I made it clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the hard problem, so that's what makes it a hard problem or a mystery. Well, he doesn't claim, he's not a mysterian, you see. He, he, this is an anti-physicalist argument he's giving. That's different, you see. Anti-physicalism is not the same as mysteri mysterianism. Okay. He's not a mysterian like me. He's a bit more inclined toward panpsychism. Okay. See, so, and, that, and that's what you predict given his paper. Because what you would need to close that explanatory gap between experiences and the brain states is some way to unify those concepts. So now if you thought that the brain had these proto-mental properties, uh, the way the panpsychist thinks, then you'd be able to reduce the bat's experiences to those proto-mental properties, because there's no, there's no contrast now between the, men, the, the subjective and the objective, the mental and the physical. So he's not a mysterian, and you don't need to right, be a mysterian right. to do this. You can be a dualist too, you see, if you just say, well, this is an argument for dualism. Yeah, that's, as I said to you, 
Dualism is not a mysterious position. Dualist says, I tell you the answer to the mind-body problem, it's not a mystery. <laughs> There's a material object, it's right. the body. There's an immaterial object, it's the soul. They're connected, and that's what Descartes thought, by the pineal gland or whatever. Um, and this is my theory, there's nothing mysterious about it. Right. Now, the opponent might say, well, it sounds mysterious to me because how is this, how is this, this causal interaction is mysterious? The dualist said, no, it's not mysterious. Cause, causal interactions are always this or that, and they can give give, tell you the story. You see? So a dualist is not a mysterian, and that is somebody who holds that there's a mystery. You might, as an outsider, say, you are a closet mysterian because this is a mystery. Or, well, better you would say it would be a miracle if anything that were to happen. That would be a miracle. You don't believe in miracles, do you? Right, right. See, that's that's different. Mysterian is just somebody. A mysterian is somebody who says that ignorance is the explanation for why we don't have the solution to this problem. And that's not what a dualist would say. Right. Or an eliminativist. There are eliminativists. They say there's no such thing as the mind to start with. That's the that's the thing. Or they say the mind is behavior. Whatever they might say. To be a mysterian is to be somebody who thinks that there is such a thing as the mind. They think it's roughly as it's characterized in common sense. But the nature of the connection between that mind and the brain is what's mysterious. Right. Even though you don't deny that at all, that no brain, no mind. I would say with complete certainty that the, brain is, that the mind is completely dependent on the brain. Right. As philosophers say, supervenient on the brain. Right. There cannot be a change in the mind without a change in the brain. There cannot be minds without brains. Now, if you ask me the question, in virtue of what does the brain have this role in relation to the mind? I'm going to say, well, that's, what we, that's what's a mystery. Right, we right, know right. How the material what. stuff gives rise to uh, right, this experience. And then, yeah. then you can go on and say to me, well, if we don't know, you can't rule out, can you, artificial brains that give yeah, rise to minds. Yeah, of course not. Right. I'm going to say, yes, we can't rule that out. Right. How do, do you then, answer the question? If how they have a property, then they can do it. How do you answer the question, how do you know other people are conscious or that the great apes are sentient or whatever? The short answer is you don't know. This is a, skept this is a problem of skepticism. It's just like the problem that you could put to me. How do you know this, that I'm talking to somebody now in my study? How do I know I'm not dreaming? How right. do I know there's any material world at all? How do I know I'm not a brain in a vat? Right. How do I know the future will resemble the past? How do I know there was a past? All good skeptical problems. Right. My attitude to skepticism is there is no answer to skepticism. Right. There is no answer. There's no. There's nothing I can. I can produce to prove to you. Now, as it happens in the case of other minds, I actually published something in Scientific American, with the, under the auspices of John Horgan. Mm -hmm. He put it on his blog, where I where I argue there, that actually the problem of other minds is the only skeptical problem which is in principle soluble. Hmm. And how is how is that how is it in principle soluble? It's actually not difficult. So as I'm wondering whether you're a zombie. So I don't know whether you have a mind. All I need to do is I just cut out a bit of your brain, stick it into my brain, because this is science fiction science. <laughs> stick it, remove the bit of my, there's the visual, so we do the visual cortex. We take off some of my visual cortex. We take out some of yours, we put it into mine. I suppose it's to do with color vision. And I put it into my brain and then we all become conscious again. If I see colors again, then I know that you were conscious before. Hmm. I know what the qualities were. If I, if I, my experience is I don't see anything at all, and I'm not conscious, then I know that you were not conscious. I know you were a zombie. So it is possible to solve the problem. And I could just put your whole brain into my head. Right, right. Well, well, in a way, couldn't we do that by, well, no, here's a different take on it, that let, let's take the Copernican principle that uh, we're not special, and I'd apply it to myself, I'm not special. I know I'm conscious and sentient. What are the chances that I'm the only one and that all the rest of you are zombies? Okay, it's more likely that you're all just like me. It's reasonable. It's reasonable. It's very, it's very like other similar responses to skeptical problems. It's more likely right. that there's an external world than that I'm a brain in a vat. Right. It's more likely that you know the future will resemble the past and it won't resemble the past. And we can get it. now that does get into questions, you know, because the skeptic is not going to give up at that point. Right. So what do you mean more likely? Yeah, What's yeah, your yeah. Base? It's more likely. Inference you to the best. Yeah. No. Okay. But it, but this but this response to the other mind's problem circumvents all of those kinds of arguments from the skeptic, you see, because you really could settle it. Now, you might, the, the, the skeptic might try to answer my argument by saying, well, suppose I would, it wouldn't settle it because maybe when I transfer the bit of your brain into mine, I start seeing colors, but maybe the brain changed between when it was in your body <laughs> right, right. And, it came, and it became conscious when it got into my brain, but it wasn't in yours. The answer 
to that would be that's logically possible, but it's not. That is not likely. Why would, would we think it would change? How would you apply that to a soon-to-come, presumably AI, advanced AI, that was apparently sentient? It was same argument. Suppose, suppose somebody created a robot, and it, when people started believing it was sentient, and there was, you know, and there was good reason for that. And you, you really wanted to settle the question: get a bit of its brain, stick it into my brain, and see whether replacing the bit in my brain that does the same job. If I have no experience, then it wasn't sentient, but if I do, it was sentient. I want to know, for example, does it smell anything the way I do? Right. I just take out some olfactory cortex, replace my olfactory cortex with that. If I don't smell anything anymore, well, that machinery wasn't wasn't producing it. If I do, then it was producing it. At a, at a function once, I met the, uh, pro- the, the chief programmer at IBM who uh, made Watson, the uh, computer that won Jeopardy. So I, you know, tongue in cheek asked him, you know, did, did, does Watson know that he won Jeopardy? I mean, was he like, yay, I won. I beat Ken Jennings, the greatest Jeopardy chan-. And he said, yeah. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, we programmed in that you won. I said, okay, no. <laughs> you could program it in to scream and yell and, and throw its virtual arms up, but that's not really healing. Well, of course. And I, I don't think any AI machine has ever been conscious. On the other hand, I think that consciousness is very prevalent in the biological world. Mm-hmm. So I'm extremely generous about attributing that to, to insects and right. probably even worse. So let's, 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 I don't let's, think any computers are there anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Let's transition to free will then because that gets uh, to yeah. D- Dan Dennett's argument that I like very much of that um, uh, sort of scalability of sentience uh, based on how many neurons you have or the complexity of your neural networks and so forth and that there's a, a you know evolution created what he calls these evitable beings – on the planet, that um, that the the future is not inevitable in a deterministic sense because the active agents in the world can affect the causal net themselves, and therefore volition comes out of having c- more complex brains that give the organism more degrees of freedom to act within the causal net. So, to me, this sounds like a compatibilist argument that, yes, we live in a determined universe, but the more complex, the bigger your brains or the more neural networks you have or whatever, the more degrees of freedom you have. So you can kind of actively choose to go down this path, this path, this path, and this path. The rat, not so much, not, not as free as you and I, but still more than, say, the cockroach. What do you, what do you make of that? So he, and as you know, he focuses on this word evitable to get us away from this idea of inevitable futures, that the future yeah. is not inevitable. It sounds horribly confused. I mean, first of all, you've got, it mustn't be conflating fatalism with determinism. No, right. No, it, he doesn't it, mean that. It's not inevitable right. in the sense in which a fatalist thinks that, because human action can change the future. It's just that human action is determined. Right. By seen conditions. Do you call what do you call yourself? You're not a compatibilist. I am I'm very I'm very happy to talk about this because my view on free will has changed somewhat dram- dramatically uh, relatively recently and to my great delight because I'd suffered my whole life from not believing in free will. <laughs> you suffered. Why? Yeah, I was, I've been what? thinking about free will since I was 17 years old. I wrote my first essay on it when I was I think 17 or 18. I was very troubled. Look, it what got me into philosophy more than anything else. I was very troubled about how there could be free will in, in a deterministic universe. You, you mean on a personal level, like how can I act yeah. in the world? Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, because of praise and blame, you know. And it, I thought intellectually it was an incredibly difficult question because it's very hard to give up free will. Yeah, I don't want to give up free will. I mean, everything in screams to me there is such a thing as free, but I could not find an intellectually respectable way to accept it. So I was d- tend to have been an incompatibilist uh, for a long period. Um, and I never wrote about the subject uh, professionally because I just I didn't have anything to say beyond that. Then when I wrote uh, my book Problems in Philosophy, which is about Mysterianism, I had this, a chapter on free will, and there I changed the, my position a bit to give more room for free will, and I became a compatibilist of a certain type. So roughly it was this: free will is compatible with physical determinism, but not with psychological determinism. Hmm. So if a person is psychologically determined to act as they do, that means necessitated by unseen conditions, uh, then they can't be free. Mm-hmm. My thinking was they, they couldn't have done otherwise. Right. They were psychologically. Okay, so that was, and then I, I injected a bit of mysterianism into the whole issue of what it means to say you, you can't do otherwise. You could or could, couldn't do otherwise. But recently I came to a different view. It was partly from reading Hume, 
actually, or rereading Hume in the inquiry, because he has a uh, section called Liberty and Necessity. It's really about the free will and laws. So he argues that laws of action are compatible with freedom. So laws of nature. He laws of nature, yeah. Laws of nature. He's a classic compatibilist. Now what he argues in that is that so far from there being an issue of compatibility between freedom and determinism, actually freedom entails determinism. There cannot be freedom without determinism. Hmm. In what well, way? So that, not just that they're compatible, you see. Right. They're, they're built into it's it. It's contained in the idea of freedom that the person is determined and moreover psychologically determined. Hmm. So completely contrary to what I said in my earlier book, you see. Hmm. So I call this position determin determinationism. <laughs> okay. Just for want of the label. Right. We don't want to just, see, if you just call it compatibilist, it doesn't capture how strong. Right. The, now, so I came up with this view myself, and then when I had a PhD student, Ken Levy, who wrote his thesis at Rutgers about free will, and I told him about this because he was an excellent student, now a law professor, actually. And he, 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 and he told me about an article by some, somebody called Hobolt, which was in Mind in 1926 or something like that, arguing there's a title like Freedom as Necessitation and Can Only Be Necessitated. So I read the article. It's a totally brilliant article hmm. arguing for this position. So I have an article. I've written, I've written a paper about it myself. So now what I, really, I do think now that um, you can only be free if, you're act, if your desires determine your actions. They can't be free. It's <laughs> essentially, essentially the point is whenever there's indeterminism, that destroys freedom. Right. That's just chance. Right. That doesn't give you freedom. So quantum so, indeterminacy doesn't give you freedom. Exactly. That's so that definitely rule, rules out freedom. So the only thing, and, it's, and then the other human part of it is that the essential notion of freedom is uh, doing what you want, doing what you most desire. If you do what you most desire, then you're free. Okay. So that's the basic. So would you make a distinction for say the addict or alcoholic who just si simply cannot control their behavior in the same way that you and I can? Now they're maybe yeah. not as driven as, say, an insect or something, uh, but they have more degrees of freedom than that, but less than you and I. That's right. I mean, there's a, there's a real question about whether they're free or not, you know, whether our concept of freedom includes them under it or not. In one sense, they are free. I mean, let's, let, let, this is the kind of point that a human would make about this. Suppose you've got an addict who really wants his heroin, and somebody's out there saying, you're not having that heroin. I'm not giving it to you. Mm -hmm. You're infringing on that person's freedom. Mm -hmm. That means the freedom to act, to act on your wishes. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. So the you're addict free. is free. The well, addict is just freely choosing a pathway that right. society is Even, saying you shouldn't. Now, so, so why do we why do we hesitate to say it's just an ordinary free action? I'll tell you why. Because the addict says, "I wish I didn't have this desire so strongly. I wish I was not. I wish I could not take this drug now." Now that that means that the person is not ex that person's experiencing himself as having an inner constraint. Now, if a person experiences their desires as constraints on them... I mean, they're saying, I don't want to do the drug, but something in my brain is bubbling up, just driving me right. to do it. But the person says to himself, I wish I didn't have this addiction. It's ruining my life. I, right. I'd want, I want to stop at this addiction, but I can't stop. They're experiencing it as like an external constraint, right? Their own desires are forcing them to do something that they don't desire to do. Right. If you say to the addict, what do you most desire to do? You'd say, not take this drug. Right. But I have an overwhelming desire to take it. Right. So I can't act on the desire I most strongly, my, my, what I call an all things considered desire. Right. So that's the way I would think of that type of case. So there are internal constraints as well as external constraints. So are, 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 can, is the drug addict, the alcoholic, whatever, just has fewer degrees of freedom or less volition than say, the non-alcoholic, the non-drug addict. That's, that, I think, is a, is, a, is a reasonable approach, that we shouldn't be thinking in all-or-nothing terms. It's a, it's a matter of degree concept. It's a comparative concept. One, one person is more free than another. That's the most relevant way to think about it. Right. So now, political, freedom is, political freedom is the paradigm of it. Some societies are more politically free than others. Some human psyches are more free than others, meaning they're not as easy for them to 
a person isn't dominated by desires they don't want to be dominated by. Yeah. A person, a similar thing can happen the other way around. I think this is an important point. A person can be an extreme moral puritan. Yeah. Who never does anything spontaneous, you know, and they may wish they weren't. You know, this idea politically that everybody wants to be free and, and live in a democracy and have the kind of autonomy, individuality we Americans have, but there's a lot of cultures that are based on more collectivist psychology where they don't want that that, that many choices. They don't want that much autonomy. They kind of like having a more structured, predictable environment. Yeah. Now, maybe I would argue, yeah, but you're just, you just don't know how great freedom is until you've had it for a while, but... Yeah. Maybe they'd say, well, you just don't know how good it is when you live in my world. Well, they, 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 whether they're right or wrong, they, they, we know about people who were brought up in a very rigid religious culture, and they've been drilled in it, and they are fearful of breaking those rules. But some inner voice in them says, I wish I was freer to act more spontaneously, but I'm so weighed down by this baggage of Puritanism, you know. So that person is experiencing their own moral judgments as an in, internal constraint. Mm hmm and sometimes they want to, and they want to. Sometimes they want to break away from it, but they can't break away from it. Mm -hmm. They're fearful. See, they you probably know about the. You probably yeah. know about the studies that, of you know, people that believe in determinism versus people that believe in volition and free will. Uh, the former are, uh, you know, less likely to take personal responsibility for their actions and act morally and so on. And that teaching people about determinism is not such a good thing. It's better right. if people believe in this, call it what you will, a useful fiction or something as, as a means of, of just improving human behavior in society. Right. What do you think about that idea of useful fiction? Uh, free will is a useful fiction. It feels like we're free. If you can't prove it, at least let's pretend yeah, that we I, are. I mean, it would it would be a, a decent fallback if you were a convinced incompatibilist determinist. <laughs> it would be a fallback position, but it's more just it'd be better if you can just believe in factual <laughs> right. freedom. We're actually free. Right. What's very interesting about this as a philosophical problem is it is a conceptual problem. It's easy to get conceptually confused about it. That's why I've had different positions. Even I can be, get conceptually <laughs> confused. About it. Um, because it's very tricky as a subject. And it's very easy to think that we're not free because we're determined. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're asking the question, could I have done otherwise? So you, I haven't said anything to you about how I handle that. Right. But I've, so you might say to me, well, you say that, you know, to be free entails being determined, but that means you can't do otherwise, doesn't right. it? Yeah. The answer is yes and no, but the no part is important. The yes part is important in this in this sense. If two individuals are exactly the same in all of their psychological characteristics, then I think they can't act differently. Right. It's uniquely determined what they do. And that doesn't mean that people are necessarily do what they do. Why? Because they could have had different desires. Right. So right. One day I desire to have fish and chips for lunch. Another day I desire pasta for lunch. Right. You know, I for lunch, but so so I can have different desires at different times. If I couldn't, then maybe we wouldn't be free. If it was if there were no, no no such possibility. But in fact, could it otherwise just means in different circumstances, I could have had a different psychological state Yeah, I would have acted differently. But, but so here's back to the active agent in the causal net. You, Colin, know that uh, you really should get up tomorrow morning at 6 and go for your workout. Now, the f you know that future Colin, when he wakes up at 5.30, is not going to want to do this. So yeah. you set your gym clothes out. You, have a, you, 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 you lay it out in a way that's the least amount of obstacles to get you there because you know future you is going to be different than current you. So you're actively right. involved in changing the future conditions. That's a kind of volition, is it not? Yeah, it is. So there is, volition is real, and it involves selecting from desires. And you can have a very strong desire at a certain time to do something and resist it. And that means that you have another desire which is stronger in another sense than that other strong one, because yeah. it's the one that wins. Yeah. So you're all things considered desire or, or judgment. Um, so all these th all these distinctions can be made room for right. in this position. Right. What you don't have is this idea that just because a person's determined physically or psychologically, that entails that they can't be free. Right. What's nice, of course, is the idea that on the contrary, it's only it's only because they are determined that they can be free. Because otherwise it would be just random. Right, yeah, yeah. There's no alternative. There's no, no, no third choice, right? So I wanted to get your opinion on that. 
I want to get your opinion on that survey of philosophers in 2009, 3,300 philosophers, professors and grad students, professionals, and, uh, you know, on 27 different issues or whatever it was. I know you're familiar with this. And on the free will one, it was, you know, 59.1 percent are compatibilist, 12 point something percent are determinist and so on. Um, How do you think of a survey like that compared to say something like surveys of climate scientists show that 97% yeah. of papers published in climate science journals say that global warming is real. We've reached a consensus. Other areas, there's not as much consensus. And in science, we have this feeling like we're, we're moving toward this, uh, you know, consensus on this is what's really true. And, and this is not. And, and I, I, as an outsider, I'm not a philosopher. I feel like it's different that the survey there is different than, than the say climate survey. All right, let's, I've thought about this because I, re- I know you're going to ask me this question, so I put a bit of thought into it. You, the way you put it to me in, in writing was, would a survey like this carry the same weight among philosophers as it would among scientists? And the answer to that is yes, it would carry the, the survey would carry the same weight if the results were similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if 70% or 90% of philosophers thought such and such, how much weight would that carry? It would carry the same weight that if 70% of scientists thought. Okay. But I don't think that's your real question. Your real question is, why isn't there more consensus yeah, yeah. In, uh, comparably to the, the consensus in science? Now, here I want to say two things about it. First of all is, there's lots of consensus in philosophy about certain issues, but not about all issues. And secondly, there's lots of lack of consensus in science about certain issues, but mm-hmm. not about mm-hmm. all issues. In fact, I don't see any real distinction in degree, degree of consensus. So let's take some things about which there's a lot of consensus in philosophy. These are things which people, I think, outside of philosophy might not be so familiar with. But I've got a list of them. Here's a, here's a thing which I think is, is somewhat familiar to people. What's called the Euthyphro argument. Uh-huh. You know that from Plato. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. The, the, the people watching this might not know. So I'm just summarizing very quickly. Socrates asks Euthyphro what makes something holy, and he says it's the, the, the gods love it. That's what makes it holy. And then Socrates answers, that's the wrong way around. The gods love something because it's holy. They're, because it's holy, not holy, because they love it. And his point there is, you can't found, find a foundation for morality or goodness or anything like that in uh, divine decree. Right. That's the way that argument's been taken. Yep. The argument was produced right well over 2,000 years ago. I would say that argument is in complete consensus that that argument worked. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that, right. That's a good He's example. Right. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. He All was right. wrong about that. And it, and Even it more than time. climate change. <laughs> I've thought it many times when I used to teach Introduction to Ethics. I would go over this with the students, and I would persuade them. They'd come in there believing the same thing that Euthyphro did. Right. And within about 20 minutes, it took me at least 20 <laughs> minutes, you know. Right. They would say, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So it's, is it the, now, the thing which may be less obvious to people might be philosophers like Plato was interested in knowledge and what the analysis of knowledge was, and one of the points he made, is that knowledge implies truth. And so that knowledge is not the same as belief. Right. Because belief does not imply truth, but knowledge implies truth. I think there'd be no dissent from that whatsoever from mm-hmm. philosophers. Mm-hmm. Knowledge implies truth and differs from belief in that respect. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of questions about how you analyze knowledge fully, and you get dissent about that, but that's a solid result, that, and a good result, you know, an important mm-hmm. result. That. Would that be related to the correspondence theory of truth? That that. Well, I was going to mention that a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, one of the profound questions people think in philosophy: is What is truth? You will find almost complete convergence on the question of mm-hmm. the truth type of correspondence. Yeah. You'll find differences in theories of what the correspondence is. Right. And we could have a long, interesting discussion about that. But they're all correspondence theories. Yeah. Yep. So people reject the coherence theory and the pragmatist theory and or the divine will theory and. You know, it's a type of correspondence, so you'll find that people agreeing on that. I think you'll find people agreeing that the the image theory of meaning is wrong. Mm-hmm. How you understand the word? It's Wittgenstein mainly. Right. Just, you can't identify the meaning of a word with the image that comes into your mind when you have it. And that was believed by many philosophers in up until Wittgenstein. Right. I think many people will agree that contemporary logical systems like predicate calculus are the correct. Uh, formalization of ordinary language sentences involving quantifiers like all, some, things like that. That's generally read. Frege and Russell got that right. right. A consensus they, they were right to make those points. The type token distinction, we didn't go on about that, but that's everybody's going to agree. Right. Yep. They're all going to agree on that. 
the uh, you can't derive an ought from an is. Right. is right. That's a solid result. Sense reference distinction. Frege's sense reference distinction again. Mm -hmm. They have different theories about what it may involve, but yep. we're going to agree the sense reference distinction. And to more more contemporary re um, uh, result of Kripke's in naming a necessity, when he distinguished between metaphysical necessity and epistemic necessity, which had been confused before, and he made it very clear. And again, I think you'd find considerable mm -hmm. convergence about that. But in, uh, uh, but on the other point, then, if you look at Science and lack of convergence. There's a lot of lack of convergence in science as well, of course. Yes. <laughs> when it gets to theories, it's quantum theory is the most obvious yes, one. Yes, yes, yes. Which, you know, which, uh, which uh, interpretation is the correct one? There's a whole Wikipedia page uh, with a nice uh, list of those. Um, and, then, and then there are others like, you know, this, how did life evolve on planet Earth? Different mm -hmm, theories about mm -hmm, that. Yeah, yeah, yep, origins that, of life, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, so you know, a few years. Of dreams. What's the correct theory of dreams? Yeah, what's the yeah, correct theory yeah. of mental illness? Well, that's a disagreement. About or that. consciousness? So it's, not, it's not clear to me. There's that much difference. Actually. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yep, these are good points. You know, a few years ago, a few scientists, I won't name them, stuck their uh, foot in their mouth when they said, you know, philosophers, they don't do anything. They've made no progress in two thousand years. All the mm -hmm. action is in science. This is obviously gainsayed by the list you just gave. Exactly. They've made philosophers have made many advances. Now, one, so you might say. Well, there's more advance in science than there is in philosophy, maybe. But the answer to that is the questions are harder. Mm -hmm. They're more difficult. They're more abstract. Well, I well here I think people are confusing, say, the technological spin-offs from science. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's <laughs> totally irrelevant, right, to the, the right. issue. Um, so the questions, are, the questions of, of philosophy are, are often more difficult. What, the, what there is in science which there isn't in philosophy is agreement about evidence, not theory, evidence. As soon as there's a gap between evidence and theory, then you get scientists disagreeing about it. But they will agree on things. Climate change is a good example, but it's yep. pretty much evidence-driven. That yeah, yeah. Now in philosophy, we don't have that kind of evidence. Right. That the scientists have. That's where they agree on. There can be disagreements in science even about the evidence, of right. course. But right. Uh, but the, the agree such agreement as there is in science results, I think, almost entirely from the fact that the evidences can be cited. So they're agreeing about the evidence. In philosophy, we don't have evidence in that way. I have a, a whole view, and I have, I have a paper about it, that, that actually philosophy is a science. Mm -hmm. it, it's a science. It's a formal science, not an, what I call an empirical science. But I, I even argue that it's an empirical science because we use intuitions when we're doing conceptual analysis. Intuitions are our evidence. There's considerable... But do you feel like in, in an area like philosophy of mind... Uh, is going to see more progress, say, from the development of neuroscience and information theory, or something like that. I don't Not really. think so. I don't think I don't think you find that philosophy of mind. You know, the classic problems in philosophy of mind. I don't think you're going to see much. I haven't seen any help from the sciences, psychology or neurophysiology, about those problems. This isn't to say they're not going to tell you about the mind. That's right. true. They will tell you about the mind. But the philosophical issues, like. Dualism versus materialism versus panpsychism. Issues about freedom, compatibilism, incompatibilism. The science is not going to help you figure out conceptual issues about compatibilism. Right. They're logical, right. conceptual types of issues. So, you know, I, just, I, can't, I don't think there's a single problem in the philosophy of mind where any of the science that we have so far hmm. has made any impact and, hmm. and resolved in them. Because they're philosophical. Right. This isn't they're not valuable. They are right. valuable. Right. Interesting. I'm like you. I'm a psychologist. I was trained as a psychologist. Right, I know. Yeah, I got two degrees yeah. in psychology. Right. I used to teach experimental psychology. Right. I know all about it. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not. It's not that big of a psychologist. Uh, so, um, but none of that. Interesting though it may be, and I, I, I liked all that. None of this classic philosophical problems about the mind is. I can see any, any real help from any of it. Okay. There's one. I tell you one thing where I, qualify a little bit. It's a bit Chomsky in this point. Uh, when Alan Turing under started to figure out computation and the idea of an algorithm and all the rest of it, that gave a new conceptual theoretical tool to the psychologists. In fact, when I was studying psychology, which was in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, it was a huge revolution. And there was a famous mm -hmm. book, Ulrich Nyssa, called Co Cognitive Psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and this was before Chomsky was around, of course, at that time. And they, he was advocating in that book the new paradigm mm -hmm. of 
the psychology was cognitive psychology. It's based basically on Turing's idea. Now that's been a very fruitful idea philosophically as well as right. in psychology. It's added a new, new option. That's really what led to functionalism right. as a theory, a philosophical theory that Henry Button you know, yep. did that one. So I think that's been that is an area where now whether that's is that an advance in science? Is it really an advance in mathematics? Right. Right. It was taken up, and the information theory, you know, which was connected to that, but, mm -hmm. you know, is a different kind of thing. That's, that's a piece of mathematics rather than a piece of science. But people who study the philosophy of science, say in graduate school, you're going to take courses in computer science and information theory and a lot of these uh, ancillary fields that seem to influence how you think about these deeper philosophical issues. Well, they don't seem to make much, they don't have much of an impact on, hmm. on uh, with the possible exception of the computational Mm -hmm. Revolution. Um, the, all the neurophysiology that I ever learned, uh, I, you know, it didn't, hasn't done anything. The only thing it's t taught me is that how the brain doesn't look capable of doing what it, <laughs> it does. It the cemented you know your it, mysterianism it, even more. <laughs> in a way, because the brain yeah. is yeah. quite a natural kind of object. It's yes. nothing yes. remarkable about it in a way. Right. It's chemicals, electricity, and, you know. Right. Uh, so. It just it makes you think how amazing it is the brain can do the things yeah. that it does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, here's a thing that you, you quote from Pinker, and I think you may be somewhat inclined to this view yourself, that it's not, that these, these, this problem of the mind and the brain is not a scientific problem, but a conceptual problem. Mm -hmm. That usually means, well, we've got some conceptual defect that is leading us to misconstrue things. Mm -hmm. I think that's not right at all. Okay. What's the right thing to say is, uh, it is a scientific problem in the sense that there must be properties of the brain that we're not, we don't know about, because the brain, the properties we do know about, are not adding up to anything that accounts for the mind. Mm -hmm. And even the even the most anthropomorphic ideas about the brain, and, and some of them are actually written into new physiology textbooks that the brain is an information processing system, mm -hmm. for instance. People yeah. say that as if it's a scientific fact. It's right. not. Right. That's a theory. That's an interpretation. Right. The, the, the idea of information, what really is information? Information in the ordinary sense is what you and I pass to you and you pass to me. Right. The idea of neural, you know, bundles that send information, really? They don't, <laughs> they send nerve impulses. Right, right. That we call they information. Things across membranes, that's all true. Say information, well, that's another, you know, that's another thing. Well, I guess so, it would be like if. The problem. We need to find out what it is about the brain that enables the brain to do all the things that it does. Yeah. Well, we're calling it information. If, if neuron X gets, you know, three impulses, or th three synaptic connections from this one, and two from that one, and f four inhibitory over here, and twenty uh, yeah. excitatory over here, and then it fires, we call that information as yeah. if the binary digits were switching. I know, but it's, it's really it's just chemicals swapping metaphor. across neurons. It's as if the, the bunch of neurons was receiving a transmission from the other one and knowing what it meant. That's not, that can't no, be happening. No, no, that's so, not happening. So, now the brain is an information processing mechanism in the sense that information comes in my eyes and information comes out of my mouth. That's okay, you can talk that way about information. The, inf the concept of information is very interesting, but, but it doesn't mean that you know, we now know what it is about the brain that explains the mind, because to say that the, the neural processes are informational processes in any sense corresponding to the personal notion of information, which is knowledge, yeah. conscious knowledge, well, that's not at all obvious that that's so. Right. So the, so the thing we've got nearer to understanding human knowledge, because we talk about the brain as processing information, I think that's an illusion. Right. Yeah. We haven't. Right. But it's a scientific problem. It's not a, yeah, okay. point of, it's not a conceptual confusion issue. It is, it is a scientific question, what it is about the brain that does it. And right. the is the idea that we can't find out. Right. But it is a fact about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Colin, we've been going uh, over an hour and a half. I wanted to give you the, the last word on a, on a broader question. Uh, since you've been in academia since the late 60s, and you've, like everybody else, been watching the campus craziness the last couple of years, does it, uh, is it really different now than it was, say, back in the late 60s when you got into college and in the early 70s and all that? Uh, or are we just noticing it more because there's more social media and coverage of the campus protests and that kind of thing? Does it feel differently to you as a professor well, now the, than the when the subject matter? The subject matter has changed, but not so much the form of it. When I was a student, 68 to 72, I was at Manchester University. We had huge sit-ins and protests going on, much disruption. 
But it didn't have to do with what is now going on on campus. Uh, it had to do with the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. nuclear and, nuclear weapons, nuclear issues. That, that's right. Um, but at the time, I always used to feel that the people on the left were often far too extreme and un, and and too crude in their assessments of what was going on politically. And I was always very suspicious of them because. Uh, you knew these were people who would be extreme right wingers by the time they were thirty, <laughs> and say it would say work. You know, they, they. So I was always in favour of a very moderate, rational, liberal left, mm -hmm. and I've never changed my position about that. So now you see new subjects coming up in universities to do with women and minorities and so forth, and some of the same extremism and lack of care in thinking um, is apparent as I, that I noticed back then. And you just want people to calm down a bit, you know, and say, yes, you've got a real issue there. I understand. But let's not exaggerate everything. Let's right. not get on witch hunts and extremism. And, right. you know, um, in the case of the Me Too movement, I'm all in favor of it. You know, it's great. I had academic girlfriends and wives my whole life, and they've been experienced harassment uh, and so on. And I've been part of that because I, in the sense, I was the husband, you know, listening to them, what they told me about it. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to it, but if I may use a, uh, a, a slogan, in addition to me too, we should have me true. Oh, yeah. Make sure it's true. Right. Make sure it's true, not exaggerated, you know, and let's be sure that we have proper due process and justice in the way things are handled. Right. It's a huge shame to take a very worthwhile cause and distort it and, you know, into something too extreme, too vindictive, too, and then you'll be liable to get a backlash if you, if you do that too. So that's my essential position. It's yep. a complicated question, that's my essential position. Yeah, that's good. Well, Colin, thank you so much. This is one of the more interesting conversations I've had in a long time. And uh, I think we really got to the root of things. We saw all the questions I wrote down. I wrote, made some notes here. We went through all of the issues. Yep, we need yep. I, think we, I think we've covered most of philosophy. <laughs> we covered a lot of philosophy, and that's the way it should be. Yeah.